My name is Raj Day, and I lead the Cybersecurity and Data Privacy Practice at Mayor Brown. Welcome to our discussion today, which we are conduct conducting in connection with the firm's recent release of its guide, Cybersecurity Regulation in the United States, Governing Frameworks and Emerging Trends. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping announcements. First, as we go along, we hope that you will ask questions by using the Q&A panel on the right side of your screen. We will make every effort to answer questions toward the end of the webinar. However, if we're not able to identify uh, your question or answer it during the time of the presentation, we would be happy to follow up with you directly once the webinar has ended. Second, regarding CLE credits, approval is pending and we will be providing an alphanumeric code at some point during the presentation. Please record this code on the virtual sign-in sheet that was emailed to you. With those program notes, allow me to briefly introduce our participants today, each of whom played an integral role in the development of the firm's regulatory handbook. Jeffrey Taft is a member of both our cybersecurity and data privacy and financial services, regulatory and enforcement practice groups. Jeff has extensive regulatory experience, especially with respect to privacy and data security issues at both the federal and state level. Alongside Jeff, we have Kendall Berman. Kendall is part of our cybersecurity and data privacy practice group. Prior to joining Mayor Brown, she served as Associate White House Counsel and most recently as Deputy General Counsel for the United States Department of Commerce. Luke Levisor is a member of Mayor Brown's litigation practice, where he focuses on government contracting matters and related cybersecurity issues. Prior to joining the firm, Luke litigated complex trials and appeals as an attorney with the Justice Department's Civil Division. Finally, we have Stephen Lilly, part of our cybersecurity and data privacy and litigation practices. Prior to joining Mayor Brown, Stephen served as chief counsel to the Subcommittee on Crime and Terrorism of the Senate Judiciary Committee where he focused on cybersecurity. We have a full presentation today, but before I turn over to my colleagues, I wanted to set the stage for our discussion. A broad consensus has emerged that cyber risk management should be pursued in a strategic and coordinated manner across any enterprise. But it increasingly is clear that diligent pursuit of risk-based cybersecurity should be complemented by close attention to the many and growing regulatory regimes that govern, cyber, govern cybersecurity across industries. To be clear, cybersecurity never will be, nor should it be, a check-the-box function. The technology and threat landscapes are evolving far too quickly to allow for that. But regulators increasingly are making clear that a company must factor regulatory compliance into its cybersecurity program. In particular, as federal regulatory requirements feature more and more centrally in cybersecurity, it's important to understand what federal regulators are doing the issues they're focusing on, and the trends that are emerging across industries. That's why we wrote our handbook, and that's what we want to focus on today. Before we start, I'd like, also like to mention the other programs that we have upcoming on these and related topics. On November 17th, our colleagues Rebecca Eisner and Lei Shen will lead a webinar on contracting for cybersecurity and privacy protections. On the same day, Jeff Taft, David Tallman, and Marcus Christian will host a Global Financial Markets Initiative, or GFMI, teleconference on cybersecurity and financial services. On December 1st, Kendall Berman, Stephen Lilly, and Laura Hammergran will host a teleconference addressing cybersecurity regulation and the Internet of Things. And we will soon be announcing dates for two further events that take deeper dives into cybersecurity issues relating to government contracting and to healthcare and medical devices. We hope that you will join us for some or all of these programs, so please keep an eye out for more information on these and other upcoming events. And with that, let me turn it over to Stephen. Thanks, Raj. It's helpful to understand federal regulatory activity against the backdrop of the cyber risk perceived by the federal government and the various approaches that it has taken to mitigate those risks. At this point, there is no doubt that cybersecurity is a national priority issue. While it was emerging as a top issue in prior administrations, cybersecurity really has become a leading national and economic security challenge over the last eight years. I won't belabor the point, but as seen in this chart, cyber threats continue to increase in volume, sophistication, and potential impact, and the federal government has taken notice. For example, as noted here, 
the Obama administration created a Cybersecurity National Action Plan that reflects the high priority that it has given to cybersecurity issues. It also has issued executive orders that led to the creation of the NIST framework and that sought to enhance information sharing and to sanction entities that benefited from the cyber theft of trade secrets. In addition, the administration has sought to enhance coordination of incident response, both internally and with the private sector, through a presidential policy directive and the draft National Cyber Incident Response Plan. It also has created a cybersecurity commission to identify key next steps to enhance national cybersecurity. We've described many of these developments in much greater detail through legal updates that can be found on our website. The federal government's prioritization of cybersecurity also is reflected in the wide range of federal agencies that have been mobilized to address various elements of the cybersecurity challenge. Here, you'll see a few of the leading agencies, the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Defense, the Department of Commerce, the Department of Justice, the FBI, and the FTC. But it's worth emphasizing this is only a partial list. We could spend the whole hour talking about each of the many different federal agencies that have engaged on cybersecurity issues. While there thus is no shortage of federal action on cybersecurity, those various activities generally can be categorized into six rough buckets. National defense and intelligence, investigating and enforcing the laws, protecting critical infrastructure, setting standards, consumer protection, and sector-specific regulation. The key point is that the federal government is using many, if not all, of the tools it has at its disposal to help address the cyber risk that our nation faces. I'll let Kendall describe this coordination in more detail. Thanks, Stephen. A lot of the government's work thus far has been intentionally collaborative. And to that end, President Obama and a variety of senior officials have repeatedly emphasized the importance of the federal government and the private sector working together to enhance the nation's cybersecurity. They have realized that because the private sector owns so much of the nation's cyber infrastructure and has valuable insights as a result, working together will be the most effective way to respond to cyber threats. And I would highlight two examples of this. First, the Department of Commerce's NIST cybersecurity framework was created to provide a flexible and risk-based approach to cybersecurity. It is voluntary, technologically neutral, and can provide a common understanding of the key elements of a risk-based cybersecurity program. The framework reflected substantial input provided by industry stakeholders and now has become a widely used reference point for companies across sectors. My second example is that the federal government has sought to enhance the sharing of cyber threat information, including indicators and defensive measures, both before and after passage of the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act in December of 2015. And the government has seen the importance of pooling insights into cyber threats. But the federal government has done more than just collaborate. It's also moved to regulate. And for that, I'll turn the mic over to Jeff. Thanks, Kendall. You're exactly right. Notwithstanding the collaborative efforts you mentioned, the federal government has taken more regulatory, and some would say more adversarial approaches to cybersecurity at times at the prompting of Congress. Federal and state regulators have used a variety of tools to set cybersecurity standards for the industries. Four stand out. First, you have traditional notice and comment rulemaking. Second, you have formal and informal guidance issued by the agencies. Third, you have supervision and examination. And fourth, you have enforcement actions. We'll discuss each of these tools in the next section of today's webinar. How and to what extent regulators have used these different tools has varied by sector. Some regulators have been very active, while others are relatively new to the issue. But the regulatory action is certainly on the rise. In fact, regulators are in many respects moving towards common views of priority issues for cybersecurity. Understanding these priority issues, including implementing tailored plans and policies, vendor management, board governance, and responding effectively to investigations and enforcement actions, will go a long way towards informing companies' cybersecurity compliance programs. With that background, we'll now turn to the key tools that federal regulators are using to act on cybersecurity and some considerations for companies as they respond to the use of those tools. In the cybersecurity context, as in many others, regulators across industries have used rules to establish governing standards for regulated industries. For example, the FCC has adopted rules to regulate privacy and data security for internet service providers. 
and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and the North American Electric Reliability Corporation have regulated electric grid cybersecurity through critical infrastructure protection reliability standards. Likewise, rules implement privacy, security, and data breach notification requirements under HIPAA. Compliance with any such rules is a key element of a compliance program for any regulated entity, and failure to achieve compliance can result in significant fines or penalties for the company. But compliance itself can be challenging. For example, a company needs to determine what rules it must satisfy and how to do so, including by addressing guidance or rules from multiple agencies that are not always aligned. Then it must ensure that the resulting focus on compliance does not distract from the need to maintain an effective and strategic risk-based cybersecurity program. The financial services sector provides a particularly good example of the use of cybersecurity rulemakings. The various versions of the Gramm-Leach-Bliley Act safeguarding rules, for example, long have regulated the protection of consumer information by financial institutions. But new rules are also addressing prudential and systemic risks, not just the protection of consumers' personal information. For example, in October of 2016, the Federal Banking Agency sought public comment on enhanced cyber management standards for large and interconnected financial sector entities. The Federal Reserve, the OCC, and the FDIC contemplate imposing these standards by various means, including a rule that would be designed to increase covered entities, operational resilience, and reduce the potential impact on the financial system in the event of a failure cyber attack or the failure to implement appropriate cyber risk management standards. And the regulators are contemplating creating a further level of standards through a two-tiered approach that imposes the most significant standards on entities that are critical to the financial sector. We will undertake a more detailed description of the advanced notice of proposed rulemaking during our GFMI call on Thursday, November 16th. It's not just the federal regulators that have been active in this area. At the state level, the New York State Department of Financial Services, for example, also has recently released a proposed rule seeking to impose a variety of cybersecurity standards on financial institutions subject to the New York State Department of Financial Services jurisdiction. The scope and requirements of this proposed rule are covered in our legal update dated September 22, 2016. The DFS proposal is also discussed in our regulatory handbook. Let me now turn it over to Luke, who will run through new regulations for government contracting. Sure. Thanks, Jeff. There also have been several significant rulemakings related to cybersecurity and government contracting. I'll briefly discuss three of them. In August 2015, the Defense Department implemented a detailed set of rules amending the DOD acquisition regulations, which are called the DFARs, with respect to network penetration reporting and contracting for cloud services. Those rules changed definitions applicable under several DFARS provisions and expanded the incident reporting requirements applicable to government contractors. The DFARS clause requires clear defense contractors to report penetrations of networks and information systems and to provide the Defense Department personnel with access to equipment and information to assess the impact of such penetration. The rule also imposed substantial security requirements applicable to cloud computing services procured by components of the DOD. Notably, several definitions applicable to the incident reporting rule were revised in a modification to the DFARS provision that was issued just two weeks ago. In May 2016, DOD published a change to its rules related to classified programs and data stored by contractors for those programs that requires contractors to develop and implement insider threat programs. The changes to the National Industrial Security Program Operating Manual, or the NISPOM, implemented by the rule are focused on classified contracts. But clear government contractors should consider implementing the insider threat program as part of an overall effort to meet the requirements of, cyber, of the cybersecurity rules addressing the safeguarding of covered contractor information and network penetration. Finally, in June 2016, the federal government, specifically the General Services Administration, or GSA, the Defense Department, and NASA, implemented a final rule establishing cybersecurity requirements that apply to all contractor information systems that hold government information. 
The rule added a new Federal Acquisition Regulation, or FAR, subpart, and a new contract clause to be included with new government contracts. This rule, like the others that I've discussed, is a good example of the types of prescriptive and detailed cybersecurity requirements that regulators are, inc are increasingly imposing by rule and that agencies are considering imposing in future rulemaking. The rule sets out 15 basic safeguarding security controls that contractors must employ to protect covered contractor information systems. Among other things, the controls described, described in the FAR clause include limiting access, limiting system access to authorized users, verifying, controlling, and limiting connections to external systems, sanitizing, destroying information system media before disposal and updating malicious code protection mechanisms. These requirements are mandatory, and the failure to comply with them and to have robust systems that ensure compliance with the government contractor can result in severe consequences. Thanks, Luke. Rules are clearly a crucial tool for regulators, but they can also be inflexible and require a substantial investment of time and resources by regulators before they are put in place. As a result, regulators also have made extensive use of guidance to impose de facto regulatory requirements on regulated entities or otherwise articulate regulatory expectations. And this guidance has come in a variety of forms. Some have been subject to notice and comment, but the substantial majority have come in the form of bulletins, white papers, speeches, and other formats. And this relatively informal format of much of this guidance can make it hard for companies to understand what regulators expect, particularly to the extent that regulators present compliance with the guidance as voluntary. For example, the FDA couches its guidance as containing non-binding recommendations that only represent the agency's current thinking on a topic. However, industry frequently relies upon these documents as equivalent to a regulation, even when they are in draft form. The FTC, as an agency focused on enforcement, has issued guidance through various publications that are intended to draw lessons from its prior enforcement actions. And one highlight worth mentioning is the FTC's 2015 publication, Start With Security, in which the agency described lessons that it believed should be drawn from its 50 enforcement actions on cybersecurity and data privacy topics. And it spelled out various controls and policies that it believes that companies should adopt to protect consumer data, including implementing strong encryption and requiring strong passwords. In 2016, the FTC published a blog post in which it explained its view that the approach it has taken in its enforcement actions is consistent with that of the NIST cybersecurity framework. Although it stopped short of saying that adoption of the NIST framework within an enterprise would be sufficient to avoid a future FTC enforcement action. Financial regulators also have made substantial use of formal and informal guidance. The banking agencies, for example, have worked through the FFIEC to issue guidance that is intended to address significant cyber risks to institutions and the banking system. Examples of FFIEC guidance include recommendations that banks participate in the FSISAC and alerts about DDoS attacks, the risks of cyber-based extortion and threats, and threats relating to the interbank messaging system for domestic and international payments. One question is how this guidance interacts with the existing rules. In their recently proposed guidance regarding enhanced standards, for example, the banking regulators specifically asked for comment on how much detail should be included in the rules versus in guidance. Decisions on that front could have significant effects on the level of flexibility banks have in complying with cybersecurity standards. And securities and commodities regulators have also been very active on cybersecurity matters, and they too have issued guidance to shape regulated entities' approaches to cybersecurity. For example, in 2014, the SEC Division of Investment Management issued cybersecurity guidance for registered investment companies and investment advisors. This guidance's recommendations include conducting periodic assessments, creating a strategy to prevent, detect, and respond to cybersecurity threats, and implementing appropriate policies and procedures. Likewise, FINRA, the self-regulatory authority for broker-dealers, has used reports and a checklist to guide cybersecurity practices in that industry. 
As Kendall mentioned, regardless of the format of the guidance, it can be a very valuable sense of regulatory expectations, both in terms of the individual controls that the regulators believe should be in place and the overall approach that regulators think is appropriate. In fact, this guidance can be valuable even for companies not subject to that regulator's authority. Regulators across industries have appeared to follow each other's work and companies are likely to benefit from considering data points and emerging trends from the other regulatory contexts. Others may consider this guidance as establishing best practices. The actions of NIFTA, the regulator for the auto industry, also provide a good example of the use of guidance. Until last summer, NIFTA had taken fairly limited steps on cybersecurity and was primarily focused on studying the issue and engaging with stakeholders through a variety of published reports. Last summer, however, security researchers demonstrated that they could remotely compromise a vehicle, leading to substantial political pressure on NHTSA and the first cybersecurity-related recall. NHTSA now has followed up with a few key pieces of regulatory guidance. For example, NHTSA issued a draft enforcement, enforcement bulletin that addressed the reporting of cybersecurity vulnerabilities. NHTSA also, um, NHTSA also released guidance on cybersecurity through two other publications. First, the Department of Transportation and NHTSA released a Federal Automated Vehicles Policy. That document generally advised relevant manufacturers to submit certain information to NHTSA in a safety assessment letter and included cybersecurity among the topics to be covered. Second, NHTSA released its cybersecurity best practices for modern vehicles, in which it gave its most detailed description yet of what it believes constitute effective cybersecurity practices for automakers. Though not issuing rules, and despite stating that its guidance is voluntary, NHTSA thus has announced what it expects of auto industry participants with respect to cybersecurity. The possible consequences for companies that conclude that another approach will lead to better cybersecurity are unclear. Here is another context. This voluntary guidance raises substantial questions for companies as they continue to refine their cybersecurity programs. While regulatory guidance has been a common feature across regulatory contexts, our next topic, regulatory supervision of financial institutions, applies only to a subset of entities. But supervision is an important regulatory tool for the agencies that wield it, and they have made clear that cybersecurity is a top priority for regulatory examinations. For example, the FFIEC has recently revised the Information Technology Examination Handbook to describe how examiners will assess the level of security risks to a financial institution's information systems and issued a frequently asked questions guide related to their cybersecurity assessment tool. Securities and insurance regulators, such as the SEC, the CFTC, and the state insurance departments, similarly have indicated that cybersecurity will be a priority issue in all of their examinations. This trend is likely to continue for the years to come. As with respect to rules and guidance, financial institutions likely should expect examiners to be focused both on issues relating to the protection of personal information and the systemic risks. Scrutiny by the CFPB, for example, which focuses exclusively on consumer financial services and products, seems likely to be significant, and perhaps more than any other agency to possibly lead to enforcement activity rather than confidential resolution of issues in the supervisory and examination process. That provides a great segue to our next topic, regulatory enforcement action. Over the last handful of years, various agencies have brought enforcement actions to sanction violations of existing rules, such as the safeguards rule, or to establish de facto regulatory requirements across an industry. For example, as seen here, there have been prominent enforcement actions by agencies such as the SEC, the FCC, and FINRA. Many, if not most, of those enforcement actions provide new insight into regulators' thinking. Even enforcement actions under existing rules, in many, many instances, make regulatory policy. This is because they often announce, or at least imply, to regulated entities how a regulator believes a given regulatory requirement should operate in practice. This puts pressure on companies to read the regulatory tea leaves and try to discern what an enforcement action means. Even though regulators may think companies can draw clear lessons from enforcement actions, they typically are cryptic with defendants negotiating to keep details out of the resulting consent orders. As a result, while enforcement actions certainly provide an important body of regulatory materials for compliance officers, they can be as confusing as illuminating in many instances. What is clear about enforcement actions, however, 
is that they can impose substantial direct costs and reputational harm on companies, as well as raise the risk of follow-on private litigation. This is true whether the enforcement act action comes in the form of a formal enforcement action or in the form of a notice of a violation or recall. Even a regulatory investigation that does not ultimately lead to any claims can impose significant burdens on a company. In terms of specific agencies, the FTC has taken a leading role with respect to cybersecurity and data privacy enforcement relating to the protection of consumer information. While many of its actions have focused on deception or whether the quality of security practices are misrepresented, the FTC also has used its unfairness authority and at times its authority under the safeguards rule to sanction data security practices that it believed were unreasonable. Many questions had arisen about whether the FTC properly could use its unfairness authority in this manner. However, the Third Circuit concluded in FTC versus Wyndham that it could do just that. And as a result, the FTC now treats it as settled that it may pursue enforcement actions for unreasonable security practices. For more information on the Third Circuit ruling and Wyndham's subsequent settlement with the FTC, please see our website for corresponding legal updates. And the FTC recently reasserted its authority to pursue such action when its commissioners unanimously overruled the decision of an FTC administrative law judge who had dismissed the long-running action against LabMD. There, the FTC concluded that an action for unfairness could be based on a significant risk to consumers, even if no actual injury had been sustained. And as discussed previously, the FTC has issued guidance documents that describe the lessons that it wants businesses to draw from its enforcement actions to date, and the FTC has sought public comment on whether it should amend its safeguarding rule, which could provide further clarity on its likely approach under that regulation. That said, exactly where the FTC's future enforcement actions will lead is unclear. However, companies should not doubt that the FTC's commitment to this issue. For example, the FTC has indicated that it is likely to get involved in the automotive industry and to focus more broadly on the security of connected devices going forward how the FTC will apply the lessons from its earlier enforcement actions in those new contexts remains to be seen. As Kendall mentioned, the FTC has brought a substantial number of cybersecurity enforcement actions under its authority to sanction unfair or deceptive acts or practices. When Congress created the CFPB in passing the Dodd-Frank Act, it gave it authority to sanction unfair, deceptive, or abusive acts or practices. While the CFPB is a relatively young agency, its one cybersecurity enforcement action against a payments provider called Dwala suggests that it is likely to follow, this, follow the same general model as the FTC. The Dwala enforcement action was technically an enforcement action about deceptive practices, but the nature of the alleged misrepresentations about the quality of the data security employed by the company meant that the CFPB had to make a determination that the underlying data security practices were not reasonable. As a result, the dual action strongly suggests that CFPB intends to regulate the substantive data security practices of the entities within its authority, not just what they say about those practices. Also significantly, the CFPB did not allege that the company had actually suffered a cybersecurity incident. Instead, the dual action suggests that the CFPB, like other regulators, is going to take a proactive approach and pursue companies that it perceives as having inadequate cybersecurity, even in advance of a data breach or other compromise. Again, like the FTC, it is not entirely clear where the CFPB intends to go next on cybersecurity. But the CFPB directors expressly acknowledged that the agency intends to regulate through enforcement actions. Accordingly, as in other contexts, businesses will be prudent to try to discern lessons from any future CFPB enforcement actions in this area. So far, we've been focusing on the various tools that regulators have at their disposal as they work to guide cybersecurity practices of the entities that they regulate. Now I'd like to shift gears a bit and talk about some of the priority issues that the regulators are pursuing across different industry sectors. In particular, we're going to focus on four issues that are highlighted in the regulatory handbook. First, implementing tailored plans and policies. Second, vendor management. Third, board governance. And fourth, responding effectively to regulatory investigations and enforcement actions. As many of you are surely aware from your engagement with regulators, agencies across industry sectors long have recommended that companies adopt plans and policies for managing cyber risks and responding to cyber incidents. 
While different regulators have used different words for this, the general idea is that companies should have an information security plan and an information incident response plan. However, in our work with clients, as well as what we've seen from regulators, it's become clear that merely having a plan is no longer sufficient to satisfy regulators. They increasingly see stock plans that companies may or may not follow as inadequate and are pressing companies to develop and implement plans that are appropriately tailored to the risks that they face, the systems that they operate, and the data that they hold. Moreover, regulators are asking whether these plans are living documents or merely are developed and put on a shelf. Regulators are pressing companies to ensure that a plan is appropriately tested and assessed on an ongoing basis, and they are inquiring whether a plan appropriately reflects lessons learned or whether it is a static plan. Thanks, Kendall. That's certainly been the case in the financial sector. As you mentioned, the FTC is currently considering whether to make further amendments to its version of the safeguards rule. But one constant in the various versions of that rule is the emphasis on written information security plans and incident response plans. Importantly, these plans should be risk-based that is tailored to the actual assessed risk that a company faces. This approach is echoed at the state level, whether in the rules proposed by the New York DFS for the longstanding security standards issued by the Massachusetts regulators. And this emphasis on tailored plans and policies seems likely to endure, even as regulators, whether in the financial services field or elsewhere, take on the most significant risks they see in the industries that they regulate. And that's true even as regulators push into new fields, such as the Internet of Things. For example, regulators, including the FDA, NISA, and the FTC, have emphasized the continued importance of effective plans and policies for managing security of the Internet of Things. And as mentioned earlier, the Internet of Things presents a diverse set of new security issues, meaning that security techniques and incident response functions may need to be reconfigured to work in this field. To pick just two examples, the incident response function may be limited by challenges reaching devices post-sale, whether because of transfer of ownership or because of the inability to remotely update simple devices. And the demands of a safety critical function may not allow encryption that would be standard in an enterprise environment. In short, companies in this field will need to consider a variety of new questions as they work to satisfy regulatory expectations in a very new context. The second priority issue that regulators have particularly emphasized is vendor management. As the quote here from the FFIEC indicates, Regulators increasingly are holding companies responsible for the security of their vendors. Some regulators have expressed concern, for example, about the possibility of the compromise of a vendor system leading to the loss of confidential data belonging either to consumers or to the company. And other regulators have expressed concern about the possibility of a compromised vendor becoming a malicious actor's entry point onto a company's network. In light of these concerns and the resulting security and regulatory risk, companies generally should consider a few key steps. First, companies should consider evaluating the security posture of their vendors through due diligence and security assessments. Second, companies should consider carefully selecting, tiering, and monitoring vendors. And third, companies should consider using well-crafted contractual protections with those vendors. As explained earlier, the federal government has used rulemaking to impose what it believes are appropriate cybersecurity and incident, and incident notification requirements on its vendors. And as Raj discussed, Mayor Brown's government contracts group will discuss the implications of these provisions in more depth during a follow-up event in the near future. But let me touch on a few of the high points here. Reflecting the complexity of this vendor management issue in the government contracting field, and for companies more broadly across the economy, the creation of a new FAR, Federal Acquisition Regulation Provision and Contract Clause, has been a long-standing project by DOD, GSA, and NASA to standardize cybersecurity rules for government contractors. The detailed cybersecurity requirements imposed by this regulation and implemented in the Contract Clause are essential considerations for companies that seek to secure federal contracts and subcontracts. They are also useful guideposts for other companies as they consider vendor cybersecurity. The federal government's attempt to standardize a FAR clause on this topic makes clear that the relevant buying agencies are convinced that vendor management of 
covered contractor information cannot be done on an ad hoc basis, but must be made a consistent element of contracting and contract management going forward. In addition, the Defense Department's decision to impose rules requiring notification in the event of a cybersecurity incident is both a significant development for contractors and likely to be a topic of great interest for procurement officers across the economy. Here again, we can expect the Defense Department's approach to be looked at with interest by other regulatory agencies. A final crucial issue for government contractors and their suppliers is that the new rules specify that prime contractors are required to flow cybersecurity requirements down to subcontractors at all levels of the supply chain, except for suppliers of commercial off-the-shelf items. This means that companies supplying or doing business with government contractors must be careful regarding the FAR and DFAR clauses that they accept and the obligations to which they bind themselves. The extent to which new cybersecurity requirements must be flowed down to subcontractors at different levels of the supply chain is likely to be a topic of significant interest for regulators across different sectors. The third priority issue that regulators have emphasized is board governance. As summarized here, regulators as well as shareholders increasingly expect directors and officers to oversee management as it implements an enterprise-wide cybersecurity program. This priority follows in many respects from the basic premise that cybersecurity should be managed as an enterprise-level risk. Regulators expect a company's approach to cybersecurity to be governed by appropriate plans and policies, to be supported by appropriate resources, to be addressed through appropriate contractual provisions, and to be based on an assessment of the risk the company faces. In other words, regulators expect cybersecurity to be managed in a programmatic way across the enterprise and they expect senior officials and ultimately the board to oversee implementation of that risk-based cybersecurity program. But board members have different roles and skills than a chief information security officer. As a result, many companies are thinking through how to position their boards to enable them to perform effective oversight. In doing so, companies are thinking about factors including the structure, frequency, and content of reporting. And they also are considering whether the board has adequate expertise or interest on the topic, and whether the board has appropriate access to internal and external expertise. To that end, I'd highlight a couple of recent examples of regulatory interest in cybersecurity governance issues. First, in the financial sector, the enhanced standards contemplated by the banking agencies will put the board and senior management in a central role in cybersecurity oversight. Not only would the board or an appropriate committee have responsibility to approve and hold management accountable to the entity's cyber risk management strategy, but it could be required to, and I quote, have and maintain the ability to provide a credible challenge to management in matters related to cybersecurity. Such a requirement or other requirements under consideration at the state level could raise significant issues for boards of directors. In a second example, NHTSA also has emphasized cybersecurity governance in its guidance to the auto industry. While not as specific as the ideas included in the enhanced standards, NHTSA too indicates that cybersecurity should be a leadership priority. And it suggests the appointment of a high-level corporate officer dedicated to cybersecurity issues. Although whether this approach would be compatible with companies' existing approach to cybersecurity and risk management more generally remains to be seen. Finally, the fourth priority issue that we would identify is the effective management of regulatory investigations and enforcement actions. When enforcement actions or investigations are pursued, they can put significant pressure upon any organization. Responding effectively in that event can make an important difference in the outcome for the company. Specifically, we would highlight three considerations. First, maintaining legal privilege can help maintain internal discipline and protect confidential information, limiting the company's ultimate exposure. Second, engaging effectively with a regulator and knowing what to reasonably expect from that engagement can help a company drive a favorable, or at least relatively favorable, outcome. Third, understanding whether and when to settle and under what terms, or whether to consider litigation, 
will help guide a company's strategy in the investigation and enforcement action. And it will help keep the ultimate focus on resolving the matter as favorably as possible under the specific circumstances. Thanks, Stephen. We've covered a lot of topics today, so before we answer a few questions, I wanted to provide a quick recap of the key takeaways for companies as they address the regulatory challenges associated with today's cyber threats. First, as we touched on today and expanded on in more detail in the handbook, there has been a large amount of regulatory activity on cybersecurity matters, whether rules, guidance, supervision, or enforcement actions. And companies should expect this regulatory scrutiny of cybersecurity practices to continue. We already can see a number of significant cybersecurity proposals in the regulatory pipeline, including the enhanced standards contemplated by the banking agencies. And even when an agency has taken a limited regulatory action, more seems likely. NHTSA, for example, has relied primarily on guidance to shape automotive cybersecurity to date, but continues to flag the possibility of more formal regulatory requirements. Moreover, enforcement actions on cybersecurity matters have been common, and there is a, no reason to believe to expect them to slow down. This is particularly true as regulatory agencies continue to be under significant congressional pressure to take action. Enforcement actions may prove to be a preferred tool of regulators as they wrestle with long-term rulemakings, but still need to demonstrate the continued prioritization of cybersecurity. Second, factors that merit considerations as companies approach cybersecurity regulation include ensuring that an emphasis on cyber compliance complements a risk-based approach to cybersecurity and does not turn cybersecurity into a check-the-box exercise within the enterprise. Understanding regulatory trends within the company's industry and across industries. And finally, identifying and responding to key issues, including tailoring cybersecurity plans and policies, vendor management, board governance, and responding effectively to investigations and enforcement actions. While managing all of these issues certainly can be challenging, doing so can help substantially reduce compliance risks related to cybersecurity and ultimately strengthen the company's cybersecurity more generally. Thanks, Jeff, and thank you to all of our presenters today. I'd now like to open the floor to questions from the audience. We have been receiving questions throughout our discussion, and many of them expand on some of the themes we have touched on. Stephen, one question that's been particularly relevant to our comments on the Internet of Things. With respect to connected devices, have regulators expressed views on what role cybersecurity should play in the device design process? That's a great question. Security by design is really featuring centrally in the regulatory response to the Internet of Things, and security by design really has become a buzzword. Uh, and that's true whether we're talking about the FTC, the FDA, or NHTSA, or other agencies. So take the auto industry, for example. NHTSA is directing manufacturers to effectively consider cybersecurity throughout the product development life cycle um, and their goal is to have automakers design systems that are free of unreasonable safety risks. And it also goes a little bit further. Um, it specifically says that um, to use a systems engineering approach that's uh, focused on a robust product development process, and also to document design choices made along the way. And this is generally consistent with the approach that industry itself has taken. Um, the industry best practices that were released earlier this year also emphasize security by design. Um, because, you know, sophisticated manufacturers obviously are thinking about uh, security throughout the life cycle. That said, it certainly should be remembered that security by design is not a panacea. It's not possible to contemplate or anticipate all the potential risks to a system, uh, particularly when you consider the types of uh, connections that may be made in the future. Um, for example, in the auto context, there are a variety of third-party devices that are now increasingly connected to automobiles that no matter no amount of security by design um, necessarily could anticipate at the time of design. Um, so that's an issue in the auto industry, and you can imagine that in less sophisticated industries where companies are, are developing and designing uh, connected products that they're pushing out to market very quickly, um, the regulatory scrutiny there is going to be very interesting to watch um, as uh, regulators assess the security of those products. Thank you, Stephen. Another question. 
Have there been any major surprises in the government-wide or DOD-specific cybersecurity rulemakings related to contractors? And is there anything particularly challenging or onerous in these new rules? Luke, do you want to take a shot at that one? Sure, Raj. Happy to. I don't think that the DODs and the civilian agencies' recent implementations of rules regarding cybersecurity have come as particularly large surprises to most sophisticated government contractors who are consistently doing business with the federal government. After all, the administration has been relatively open about its increasing recognition of the threat faced by the government and by companies, companies doing business with the government. Um, and the agencies and the councils that work on developing rules have sought contractor input regarding the, the proposed rules um, and have modified draft rules in response to a lot of the input that they've received. With respect to challenges and onerous requirements, um, the vendor management, um, under the vendor management uh, issue, the flow down requirements um, are aspects of many types of government contract rules. They're always difficult to manage, um, but, uh, well, and the contractors have the same types of concerns regarding the new and increasing requirements related to cybersecurity. Um, particularly, they've, they've had difficulty and issues with uh, some of the flow down requirements in implementing them. Making certain that subcontractors at all levels of the supply chain are aware of and are complying with new and changing requirements requires an infrastructure and a substantial amount of effort. It's something that large, sophisticated government contractors are familiar with and have done for years in different contexts. However, for smaller contractors trying to manage, um, sorry, for smaller contractors and those that are trying to manage uh, subcontractors, that can pose difficulties. And such companies don't generally have the same infrastructure and leverage that, is, that large government contractors do, and that poses difficulties and problems. Um, and contractors and suppliers, uh, which can be commercial companies that don't think of themselves as government contractors but agree to provide non-COTS or non-off-the-shelf product to a government contractor, can be and often are surprised by the requirements um, that they become subject to by doing business with government contractors. Um, and that, that poses substantial difficulties, and I think in the cyber contact has, po has been difficult for some of these contractors or companies that supply contractors. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Uh, Kendall, another question deals with some of your remarks uh, regarding the FTC. Can you provide some more details on the 10 lessons in the FTC Start with Security Guide? And is there a specific area of FTC focus or interest with respect to cybersecurity? Sure. So the Start with Security Guide is, is pretty short and straightforward, and what it really does is distill 10 lessons for companies based on the FTC's enforcement actions. Um, and one lesson that I'd highlight is actually, you know, the, the title of the guide, which is to start with security. Um, you know, as Stephen described, this is a reference to building in security from the start. Um, it's described as uh, security by design, and that means that in terms of the beginning of the business decision-making process, you think about what kind of data you collect retain and use. Um, other lessons from the, the guide are really more at a higher level of process recommendations, such as maintaining current security and addressing vulnerabilities as they arise, um, to pretty standard security precautions, such as requiring secure passwords and authentication, and segmenting your network and considering firewalls. And the idea here is that it's a general guide that can be tailored by businesses to their specific uh, needs and risks. Um, so the FTC has also put out some additional guidance on related security topics that applies to different se sectors, and I'd highlight just one. There's a Start with Security pamphlet almost that's specifically designed for mobile app developers that in part translates what the, the 10 lessons more generally are for in the mobile app environment. Awesome. Thank you, Kendall. I think we have time for at least one more question. So let's see. In discussing financial services regulation, uh, we noted that new rules are beginning to address systemic concerns. Could you elaborate on the kinds of systems risks that regulators are focusing on? 
Uh, Jeff, that looks like a good one for you. You want to take it? Thanks, Raj. I'll take that one. Um, while regulators remain concerned about the security of consumer information, and the state data breach laws obviously require notice in the event of unauthorized access to consumer information. Um, one of the risks that's rising to the forefront now is the risk to the financial services sector, and in particular, critical financial services sector infrastructure. Uh, the regulators are really concerned about what's going on in this space because any sort of a cyber attack or cyber breach there could result in something that would both undermine the financial stability of the United States and also undermine consumer confidence in the financial services system. And those both would obviously have devastating impact on the U.S. economy. Um, these services would typically include clearing and settlement for stocks and, and government securities such as U.S. Treasuries, also large payment networks. We've seen a lot of focus recently on um, payment networks and the messaging of, of payments um, and that's an area of great concern, obviously, because every day billions of dollars move back and forth on the banks and over these payment networks. So any disruption there would have a, just a devastating impact on the global economy. Also, after the Dodd-Frank Act, many financial transactions can now trade or, or clear over exchanges or clearinghouses. Um, those clearinghouses have a lot of concentrated risk because they're processing trades on a daily basis. And any disruption there could have a devastating impact, not only on the U.S. economy, but also on the, on the global economy. So I think when the banking regulators are looking at it in terms of their enhanced standards that they've been proposing, they're thinking about it from what could happen to the U.S. financial services system, not the individual institutions. And that's a little bit of a different focus than we've seen in the past, where they're focused on the safety and soundness of the institutions, and also the safety and protection of the customer information. Again, this is a much bigger issue. It's an issue we've seen with respect to power grid and other things that are uh, of critical, um, critical infrastructure for the U.S. economy and the U.S. Um, government. So that's what's going on there, and I think that's a trend that's obviously going to continue. And I think as financial transactions become much more interconnected on a, on a global basis, it's not just a U.S. issue. There's going to have to be global coordination amongst the regulators, both at the banking securities level and other levels, in order to truly make this work. Because as we've indicated, you're only as strong as your weakest link, and if some country's not holding up their end of the bargain, the whole system's going to be vulnerable. That's great. Thank you. Well, we've definitely covered a lot of info today, and we're coming up on the close of our time. So I think that's about all we have for, for the moment. Thank you again to all of our presenters for their comments and to our audience for your participation. As I mentioned earlier, if you submitted a question and we didn't have a chance to get to it, we will follow up with you directly. And if you have any other additional questions related to today's topic, please email Jeremy Fegley at jfegley at mayorbrown.com. Finally, if you'd like to request a copy of our firm's guide, Cybersecurity Regulation in the United States, Governing Frameworks and Emerging Trends, please make your request through uh, the website address that's on the screen now, which is mayorbrown.com slash cyber dash book. Again, that website is mayorbrown.com slash cyber dash book. Thank you again for joining us today and have a great afternoon.